Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hirsch, is that, is that sounding okay? Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. Well, everyone, my name is Brandon Lanners, and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Global Learning here at Cornell, and I'm going to be the host for today's event. It's great to see uh, so many of you in person after we had our time together during the virtual portion earlier in January. Thank you for attending our international student orientation, and I know you are going to find it helpful. This mic is very sensitive, so I just want to make sure. Lauren, am I still sounding okay? Great, thank you. So I hope everything went smoothly with your travel and getting moved in. So before we start, um, note that we're going to be recording this session and we will post it online. Um, we're gonna send the link to everyone. We also have, as you can see, a transcription service to make everything easier to follow. Please make sure to turn off your cell phone. Um, also make sure that you identify the emergency exits um, you can see that we have exits in the back and one over here to the side. Um, you're free to get up and use the restroom as you wish. Um, you can find those by going through the back doors and then down on the right and further down on the left. So I would like to start our time together uh, with a welcome from our global Cornell leadership. Wendy Wolford is our Vice Provost for International Affairs and the Robert A. and Ruth E. Paulson Professor of Global Development. Wendy? No, hi everyone. It's really awkward to have like 20 people in the room and still have to use a microphone. Um, but we have to use the microphone because it's being recorded. The undergraduates couldn't make it today because there was an unexpected conflict and so they have to see this afterwards. And so to the undergrads who are watching this afterwards, hello. Um, and all of you, uh, welcome to Cornell. Welcome to Ithaca. How many of you were in Ithaca before the start of the semester, the semester before? Just just a couple who look like native Ithacans. No, maybe not. <laughs> maybe a few days or weeks. Um, how many of you came from a town that was smaller than Ithaca to Ithaca? For who is okay? So from so how many people were in the town roughly that you came from? Yeah. 800. Okay, so this is the big city. <laughs> Good. Good. For most of you. Ithaca is probably a little bit smaller, statistically probably for most of you anyways, Ithaca is probably a little bit smaller. How many people came from a place that had winters with snow in them? All right, so not a small amount, maybe maybe, maybe 25%. Um, I think you are so smart for starting in January because this is about as crummy as it gets. Right, this kind of gray, cold, when it snows, it's gorgeous. Like when it snows, you'll be happy. When it's like this, then you're like, this is Ithaca. And then you go inside and you study. Um, so it's quite a devious plan. But it's smart to start in the January uh, term because then every month after that, every semester, every season, you know, later on in spring, summer, the fall is all fantastic. You're like, why did I think the weather here was so bad? It's because you started in January, but it will just get better. So welcome to Ithaca. Welcome to Cornell. Congratulations on getting here. Um, I've been here for 12 years. I was a professor at UNC Chapel Hill before coming here in 2010. Um, and I'm here in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I'm a sociologist, um, qualitative stuff. I do, um, I have many graduate students, many of whom are international. And I would say, particularly for graduate students, you know, we have this whole office here. This is not particular, sorry. For graduates and undergraduates, we have this whole office that you'll learn about today that really is for all of you. Um, we advocate for you, we do um, immigration status work, um, we understand that you are Cornell students, but you also have this international status that may at times mean that you have particular opportunities or particular challenges as students here. So we have immigration, we have international people who do work on the career side, who do work on the inclusion in case there are particular elements to 
adaptation that are um, because of perhaps coming from further. So homesickness, which often doesn't feel like a mental health issue, but really is and can really interact with other pieces of being on campus that um, this office is, is at least um, aware of how much um, being an international student can shape your experience here and working for you. So the first thing I want to say is um, come see us early and often. We have a lot of people who can walk you through, and you'll meet them today, different aspects of immigration, of career services. Um, you know, I do have a number of graduate students who are international, and one of them graduated, got a fantastic job, couldn't start for six months because the immigration office at the new university, UC Berkeley, very experienced, but hadn't done all of the paperwork correctly, so she couldn't actually teach for the first six months that she was there. So reach out to us when you're um, when you have any questions about status, when you're looking at career opportunities afterwards, and then um, hopefully when you go to wherever you're going, you'll have similar um, support. So that's the first uh, thing that I wanted to say in addition to welcome is just that we are all here for you. And if you need anything that doesn't seem to be obviously offered, just reach out because we've had a lot of conversations with the student union, international student union for undergrads, the graduate students um, international uh, association, and a lot we meet once a semester um, for dinner with the um, association reps. So the uh, student group representatives come to, come to dinner or to lunch. And so we talk about things that they've discovered that people need. And then we try to think about how we can provide those services or other kinds of activities. Um, so just keep that in mind. I think the second thing is the um, a distinguishing characteristic for me at Cornell is just how collaborative people are. If you're a graduate student, we operate with fields that are different than departments or disciplines, and it's pretty unusual. I mean, I haven't been at another institution that had graduate fields that crossed departments and colleges. And the same thing for the undergrads. We have majors that cross colleges, and they tend to be more problem-oriented than discipline oriented. Um, I think that's incredibly powerful for science to be both excellent and relevant, to think about starting from the problem, you know, what is the you know, issue to be looked at and what disciplinary tools, what methodological tools do you need to bring to bear? So Cornell is this fantastic place where hopefully you'll be taking classes from professors and with students who are in many different departments and many different disciplines. My graduate students are lucky because they get faculty advisors who are in three different departments in addition to me. You know, that's also really unusual and fantastic. So I hope you can take advantage of that. Did you have a question? No, you just want him to come sit next to you. <laughs> it's important. So that's the third thing I would say. In addition to come see us early and often and um, take advantage of the unique intellectual environment that Cornell is. The third thing is make a lot of friends and do things outside of school. I think part of the reason why Cornell is so great and why there's such an incredible experience is that there's very little else to do, right? So you're not necessarily going to spend a lot of time getting lost in the museums. <laughs> That's so unfair to say, because we do have some great museums, especially if you go up to Auburn, which is like an hour away, there's an agricultural museum. That's really great. Um, and then we have, of course, Elizabeth Stanton, if you're interested in suffragettes and women's rights. Um, but we don't necessarily have a lot of the offerings of a big city, but we do have a fantastic natural environment. So if you like to hike or ski or skate, if you're interested in learning how to skate, um, we have a great rink. Um, there's just so much to do that I hope you take advantage of that in addition to really getting into your classwork. Um, so welcome. I won't keep going on and on because um, I know you have a really packed agenda, but it's great to see you all. And I hope that our paths cross often while you're here. Well, thank you, Wendy, uh, for your advocacy and commitment to supporting international students and scholars at Cornell. I think, um, you know, during our virtual session, we had one of the people from our student panel say that one of the best things that they did 
during their time here was getting uh, Xbox, so video games, and that gave them you know, more to do. But I agree, there is a lot here to do. We actually just took some friends that are international. They've only been here for a couple of months. We took them ice skating last weekend and to a great pizza place in downtown Ithaca, then for ice cream. So the calories all kind of, you know, evened out, um, but really do try to get out, um, enjoy, you know, not just Cornell's campus, but enjoy what's happening in Ithaca, uh, you know, upstate New York. Um, as Wendy has said before, you know, we are, what is it, centrally isolated? So we're centrally isolated, um, you know, which means we're actually a pretty close distance to a lot of really neat places. Yes, like New York City, but also, you know, Toronto. Um, for the first time this past summer, we went to Montreal, which was really neat. So do take advantage um, of the time that you're here and all the people that you can meet. So um, I do just want to reiterate that welcome on behalf of my office, the Office of Global Learning. We do look forward to supporting you over the coming semesters and years. And as Wendy said, we provide at least two primary services to all of you. One of those is that uh, support on immigration status, employment, and just making sure that you're well informed on the rules and options that are relevant to you. And the second piece um, that I work on very closely with my colleague, Lauren Gabuzi, who's been in touch with you. Lauren, want to say hi to everybody? There's Lauren. Um, we do a lot of work on what we call student inclusion and success. So we'll be excited to see you at our upcoming programming and to hear how we can make you feel more welcome and to ensure that you are thriving here at Cornell. So for the rest of our time together today, um, we're going to hear uh, some presentations from invited speakers from several key areas uh, for international students. Um, don't forget that we also have uh, many different resources online uh, from other campus units um, on our website, you know, which will send you that link again. We have lots of resources for getting started at Cornell and um, some campus units that we weren't able to fit into the presentation time today they also put together resources specific for you. We've sent those to you already and we'll make sure to send them again. Um, we'll send that when we uh, send you the recording of this session. Following our speakers, um, we're going to have a reception with light refreshments and a hot chocolate bar. So uh, that gives you a chance to get to know each other. Uh, we've also invited some student, uh, international student organizations um, and some other return students. So you get a chance to uh, meet people who have been here for a while and get some tips. So we are now going to move on to our presentations. Our next speaker is from my international services team and will provide information related to immigration status. Join me in welcoming Hersh Sodia, Senior Immigration Advisor in the Office of Global Learning. Thanks, Hersh. Welcome everyone. Uh, can everybody hear me? Awesome. So uh, as Brandon said, I'm Hirsch Sodia. I'm one of the senior immigration advisors in international services arm of the Office of Global Learning. So the way I like to put it, we're kind of your home away from home, right? We're, we're going to be kind of that central hub that has information, uh, anything that's related to immigration or maintaining your status while you're here, or if you're looking for employment as such, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of give you a brief overview of some of these items, okay? And I would say one thing I would suggest is make sure that you visit our uh, website often. It is quite uh, uh, filled with a lot of information and I would say that should be kind of your normal touch point, at least, to get the basics of understanding of what's going on. I know when uh, Wendy had mentioned friends, it's great to get uh, get to know friends and get ideas uh, from friends. But I would say when it comes to immigration stuff, turn to us, okay? Because what we're going to do is when we have a conversation with you, it's not just general information. At times it's general, but then we are also looking at your specific case, looking at your record, and then kind of giving you advice based on your scenario, right? Which might be slightly different than the person I see after you, okay? So kind of get used to looking at that information on that website. So the things that topics we're going to cover are going to be maintaining your status, employment, and travel. So kind of, again, in the broader categories, 
Starting with maintaining status. Well, let's talk about uh, what is a status, right? A status is the visa category that you are granted entry into after you arrive at the port of US entry, right? So when you all arrived, you had a visa in your passport, but you didn't have a status yet. At the point of uh, the port of entry, when you met with that immigration officer, they probably stamped your passport as well. And that stamp had a uh, entry visa category that matches your visa. All right, so if you're an F1 student, you were entered into a status of F1. If you're a J1, you'd be entered as a J1. Okay, so that there's a slight difference between a visa and a status, okay? So once you're entered, now you're in that status, okay? So one of the first things to do once you've come here, now that the government has allowed you entry in, into the US, the government wants to know is, did this student actually report to your institution? Okay, so one mechanism for doing that is making sure that you go on our website and activate your status. Okay, so you'll fill out a short form, do it online if you've not already done so, and that collects that information about you, and then it pushes that to the government database that houses your immigration record, and it activates it. Okay, so it continues to remain in initial status for a while because it's waiting for that student to report to the institution saying, hey, I'm here, I was granted entry, I'm here, and I'm participating in my program. So if you have not done so, I would say, you know, if you're able to do it today, do it today, but make this a priority because it's very time sensitive, okay? The other thing is making sure that you're enrolled full-time each semester, okay? That means for you, it's gonna be, generally speaking, it's gonna be spring and it's gonna be fall. Essentially, what the government says is you are enrolled in two semesters full-time, and then you get one semester as a break, okay? So summer, generally, is that break time. It's not required for immigration purposes for you to be enrolled in order to maintain your status, okay? But just remember that you have to be full-time now. The good part is there's a, there's a backup. If you're not full-time enrolled, we will let you know, okay? because there's a list that'll come up that says, okay, these are the people who are not enrolled. We send you a reminder email saying, hey, make sure you're enrolled. Again, as Wendy and uh, Brandon had also said, reach out to us. If you have any questions or concern or think, oh, maybe I need to ask, do it at that point, right? Don't wait, okay? And communicate as often as you like. Good question. So for graduate students, right, that full-time marker is determined by your department, okay? So generally speaking, I would say close to 12 credits is gonna be, but what I would say is if you have, if you wanna know for sure, ask your academic department, okay? It's a little different for undergraduates. There's, for undergraduates, it's a specific 12 credits each semester. For graduate and professionals, check with your department, okay? But I'm, I'm guessing, I think it'll be around 12 credits will usually put most grad students at a full-time status, okay? Again, if something differs, right? Let's say if you're no longer able to maintain full-time status, first thing you wanna do is just contact us, okay? Say, this is who I am, this is the concern, and then we can kind of start that conversation going and see what options are available. The other uh, thing is to not work off campus without work authorization. This is very crucial. So there is a distinction that you can work on campus without any special authorization from our office. Okay, so you could do be a TA or work in the library. Um, that's perfectly okay. But it's when you want to work off campus and for majority of the student, that's gonna be an internship, right? When you want to do that, first thing again, start with us. You don't, again, that's why I push the website so much so you don't have to wait for that weekend to be over in order to get that answer, right? So at least you can go to the website, take a look at the basics of what it is to, under, to work off campus, and then communicate with us about your specific scenario and saying, you know, I read the basics, but I don't think it fits the, the things that I'm looking to do. And then we can have a, a discussion on how to go about 
getting an authorization to work off campus. Good so far? The other thing is making sure that you're following all policies and laws, not only of Cornell policies, right? Because they are academic based for the majority, right? So you want to follow those, but also your federal regulations, state regulations. Uh, when in doubt, again, I'm going to keep harping on that. Ask lots of questions, right? It's better to ask a question and, and get that answer cleared off than to wait and think that you know the answer, okay? So just make sure you're following. Specifically, when I, talk, when I talk about federal policies and all that, I'm talking about first and foremost, making sure that you're, mean, you're doing what your visa requires you to do, right? Primary things are making sure you're enrolled full-time, you're not working off campus without work authorization, you're working a maximum of 20 hours when you're on campus. Three basic things to kind of be aware of at least. And the other thing is going to be is if you are right now, wherever you're staying, let's say next semester you change your address, right? It's important to, again, go in and update your address through, you can do it through your student cert center. That'll automatically update your uh, address in the Cornell system. And then we'll get that information and we can update that. Okay. That's going to be very important. Again, the reason why I'm not covering too much is because a lot of stuff is on our website and I don't need you to remember. I just want you to remember where to go get the information, right? That's going to be a key part. Okay, the other things are going to be making sure that you're keeping your passport valid. What, what does that mean? That means not only that it's not expired, for most of you, it might be quite a few years before it, it expires, but also that it's you know, not destroyed, right? So if you put it through a wash or gets torn or something like that, make sure that if that happens or if your passport gets lost, communicate with us and we can help you to kind of navigate you through how to get a new passport, okay? What I recommend is even though your passport may say don't make a copy, I say make a digital copy and keep that as a backup, okay? So at least you have proof that you had a passport. Make a copy, additional copy of your profile page, your biographical page, and also of the visa, the US visa, okay? You'd be surprised how many times the passport does get lost. So it's always a good idea to have that. If you are running academically, let's say you're set to graduate in a year, right? In a couple of semesters. And for some reason, right, that's beyond your control, you know, falling sick, or you ended up taking, you know, changing your major or such, and now you require more time in order to graduate, again, reach out to us, okay? Because we'll have to, all of you have that I-20. Anybody here on a J-1 visa? Okay, so all of you have an I-20 document, right? That has information about your program. It has a start date of their program, end date of their program. So what we would need to do is extend that program. Right. When we extend that program, it generates a new I-20 for you. Okay. So it's going to be crucial that you talk to us ahead of time, and then we can help kind of get you that updated I-20. Okay. And that automatically prolongs your status in the United States at that point. If you plan to transfer, right, after you finish your major here, maybe you want to go to another institution, Again, there's procedures for doing that as well. That's making sure that you communicate with us so we can take your record, immigration record, and send it to another institution, right? Only one institution can hold your record, immigration record at one time, okay? So that's also something to keep in mind. Again, I know a lot of information, right? But you know where to go look for this information. The Office of Global Learning, right, website. Okay, so the other thing is making sure that you, this is kind of in the long run. So something you don't have to focus on right now, but as you get, as you uh, complete your degree, you will have an option to apply for employment authorization. Okay. And with that authorization will come certain requirements for you to make sure that you are abiding by those and making reports in a timely manner. This is something, again, we will have a discussion with you in your final semester, 
Okay, so in the graduating semester, that's when you want to start thinking about um, employment authorizations after you graduate. So I kind of briefly touched on this, right? On-campus employment, so employment options for this. This is going to be, so while you're uh, still enrolled, you can, again, work on campus for up to 20 hours without any special work authorization, okay? So you don't need to come to our office and say, can I, can I work? Yes, you can. It's an automatic authorization to work on campus for up to 20 hours per week while classes are in session, okay? So remember I had mentioned that summer. So summer, if you're not enrolled, you're still maintaining status, you could work more than 20 hours per week on campus. So let's say if your department was, if you were working for a department, the department said, hey, could you work 30 hours per week during the summertime? Sure, you can do that. No special authorization needed. Again, as long as you're not enrolled during that semester, right? If it looks like that you may, have to work or want to work more than 20 hours, come talk to us, because then we have to see how you could do it, okay? Right, it's, it's very limited options, but we I would rather that we have a discussion to figure out some options, okay? So working off campus, this is that time that uh, usually what happens is when students arrive, they'll be here for two semesters, and then after two semesters, you have an option to work off campus. Okay, this is mainly for your uh, internships that uh, you're gonna be looking for in your field of study. So for this, this is when you do need that off-campus authorization from our office. It'll start with our, with our office and usually for F2s, it's going to be what is known as CPT, curricular practical training. Okay. So this is basically practical training that's linked to your curriculum, so to your major. What the government is saying is that we want you to go out there and get that work experience, field experience, because you've just been, here's the theoretical stuff that you've been doing now, we want you to have that practical training experience. But at the same time, here are the parameters of that practical training. And one of the requirements is that has to be linked to your curriculum, meaning that has to be your, whatever major you're doing, that's what you should be out there doing the practical training in. And 99% of the time, that's what students wanna do anyways, right? But for that, start with our office, have a you know plan ahead, okay? It counts for, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is that uh, the student is uh, here as an exchange student and would they be uh, eligible for this off-campus employment? So it only applies to those who are seeking degrees, majors that they've had. And again, one semester is not enough. It have to be for two semesters before you can apply for this. Right, it's, it has to be related to your major, exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's a good question, actually. We, we do get uh, those questions quite often. Yes, in the back there. Ah, the question is, what if I'm a transfer student? I was hoping somebody would ask me that. Now, you could be eligible if you're transferring. What that means is a student is here in another institution, they were here for an X amount of time, maybe they finished one degree and are coming to our institution and transferring that immigration record to us. This is what I was talking about earlier about transferring the record, right? So now they're here. Again, if even with transfer students, that enrollment carries over. So if that student was here for at another institution for at least one semester or two semesters, then that information gets carried over and counts towards that eligibility of two semesters of enrollment. So my question is, were you here for at least, uh, what, one semester or two semesters? How long were you here? Yes. Three semesters. Okay, so for this student here who's in three semesters, they're already eligible 
for CPT because they've already met that two semester requirement and it's a continuation of that immigration record. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question on that? Okay. So those, I know that we don't have any uh, academic, uh, any J1 students, but just in case, since we are recording this, I'm gonna mention um, J1 students who are here are eligible for an equivalent off-campus employment, but it's called academic training. And they too must go through our office to get that employment authorization. So I kind of covered already the basics, but I'll kind of reiterate that uh, for CPT, you have to be here at least two full semesters enrolled active in, remember I was talking about that active, activating the status, it's important for one of these reasons also. You have to be in an active status, okay? And then again, internships has to be directly in your field of study um, and can be used while you are studying. So the CPT component is as long as you have a curriculum, you can, you're eligible for CPT, okay? The application will go through our office, the Office of Global Learning's International Services side. And that information and approval will be on your I-20. So you'll get a new I-20 that has authorization on it, okay? And it, the, the important part about CPT is it's employer specific. So if you wanted to work for an employer X, it'll be for that employer, not just a blanket work authorization. The other component that uh, is listed there is the optional practical training. And this is for those who are gonna be completing their program, have been here for two semesters and now graduating and they wanna work for an additional time. So generally speaking, this application also starts with our office, but there's an additional component where you also have to seek employment authorization from the government. So it's a two-part kind of a situation. Starts with us and then you move to the government application and it's the government that provides the employment authorization in this. And generally speaking, you get it for 12 months for the first time. And then there's a component for those of you who are in a STEM major, right? You get an additional 24 month extension that you can apply. You had a question. Correct, yes. So the only, and the question was, I'm here for, it's a two semester degree, but this is my first semester. Can I apply for CPT or in this case, that internship off campus for summer? Generally speaking, no, because you have to meet that two semester requirement. And the reason why I put that generally, because usually that's what the condition is, unless, so there's a clause that says, unless, your program requires you to have immediate participation for an internship. That means not just for you, but for everybody, there's a requirement in that degree that says, yes, you must participate immediately in an internship, okay? So there's that clause in there, right? So let's say if you're not able to meet that requirement, right? The two semester right away, I would say focus on then that OPT concept, right? The OPT, optional practical training, is gonna be the authorization you wanna seek, okay? Now, the good part about the OPT is it's not employer specific. It's a blanket employment authorization for you to work in your field of study. You could work for one employer in your field of study, you could work for five employers simultaneously in your field of study, and you'd still be okay, All right? So it's slightly different, All right? Because why? Because you've already met your curricular requirement now. Your curriculum is finished, therefore it's not, does not have to be driven only by that curriculum. It still has to be in your major field of study because it's still practical training, right? Yes. So the question is, if somebody wanted to work, couldn't they apply for a visa? 
Technically, no, it's the employer that applies for a visa. So the difference is CPT, OPT are benefits under the F-1 visa. So you're not getting a separate visa when you do a CPT or OPT, right? So you self-petition for that. But when it comes to H-1B, which is an employment-based visa, that's a different category. An employer has to sponsor. So they have to request from the government that says, could you please grant an H-1B for this future employee of ours, right? If the government says yes, then you switch to an H-1B and you can work under there. So it's possible. It's possible. It's not a self-petition. So I just want to make sure that you understand that component. So which one is better is the question. Is it better to use H-1B or have an OPT? Well, it depends on your situation. So let's say you, if you get a job, let's say an academic job, right? At times, if it's a, if it's a tenure position or so, then most institutions will say, no, we're going to petition an H-1B for you. It's not going to be OPT because OPT is a short-term temporary employment, right? So H-1B allows for a longer time of employment, okay? So it all depends. At most of the time, what I've seen students do when it comes to um, private employments is they'll start with an OPT because not every employer will say, yes, we'll petition an H-1 for you. A lot of times they don't know you. They want to get to know you. They want to know your uh, capabilities and how can you contribute to the growth of that, inst that employer, right? So they'll usually say, okay, well, we won't start out. We, we will do an H-1, but we don't do it for everybody starting out, right? In that case, that's, that's what you want to do is you want to do an OPT. And those who are in STEM majors, the good thing is a lot of times uh, employer will want to sponsor, but they'll say, let's not do it right now. You've got three years of employment authorization. Let's work to that. Why? Because that then you tack on an H-1 that really maximizes that employment authorization time, right? So it's also a strategy of how you want to go about doing that. This would be a good question to have when you're getting closer to graduating and having that one-on-one -on -one with us, right? Because this, this is where we sit down and, and talk about different strategies and options. I like this. This is good questions coming through. Okay, so as I was talking about earlier that, you know, you go through the employment authorization with the government. The government is the one that will send you an employment authorization. And then if you're a STEM major and you're eligible to apply for an extension, you would do that towards the end of your OPT. And that's a separate process altogether. So the last topic is travel. So generally speaking, it's not traveling within the United States. You know, it's traveling outside the United States and wanting to gain re-entry. And it's always about getting re-entry. It's never about exit. Exit is very easy, right? So it's the re-entry part. But what I would say is I'd started by saying, making sure that you make a copy of your, your passport and your visa. It's because of that. A lot of times students will travel, do a short term travel. Let's they go to Mexico or, or Canada or so, and they've lost their passport. Okay, so this is why you want to have that digital one. So at least when you are requesting a new passport, even with your own government, they may want to see proof. Okay, so this is why you want to make sure you've got copies of that passport, digital passport. But the things you want to make sure that you... Uh, look for when you're traveling and the documents you carry are making sure you carry one an unexpired passport. Okay, you generally speaking, you want to make sure that your passport doesn't expire for at least six months from the date you plan on re-entering the U.S. That's a good general rule to remember. Okay, six months. That okay, if I'm I'm traveling now, I'm coming back on February first. I want to make sure my passport is valid for at least six months into the future from that date, okay? Making sure that your visa has not expired. Everybody here will have a different visa expiration time. Somebody, it might be a single entry for one year, 
somebody, it might be multiple entry for three years or five years. So it really varies, okay? So don't think that everybody's gonna have the same blend. So look at your specific visa and um, go ahead and take a look at that. And again, if your visa is gonna expire, communicate with us, then we can uh, give you some options on that and what to do. Okay. Make sure your I-20 trial is signed. Everybody has, a, has an I-20 that should be signed on page two. Page two is where the travel signature comes from us. We are, I'm one of the designated school officials. There are only specific people who can sign that I-20 and it's valid for one year from that date of signature. So that's fine. That that visa has been given to you by the government, right? So they have given you a specific time, right? But that visa will be valid while this program is you're here, okay? Or unless you were to transfer to another program, right? If that that CBIS record continues, there's a continuity of that. That visa is still valid for entry and exit, even though it won't say Cornell on there. It still has your CBIS that N number that's there that shows continuity. Okay, yeah. Make sure that you also carry proof of registration, right? So of enrollment that you get, go through the registrar's website and you can easily download your proof of, of enrollment. That just shows the entry, the port of entry officer. Yes, I was here, I was complying and I was enrolled, right? Making sure the other thing is carry a financial proof. It's not always necessary, but it's always a good thing to have. So if you've got a TA ship or such or assistant ship carry documents that show that, yes, I've got the financial means to be here in the United States. Okay, okay so that was my, my kind of lengthy conversation about this topic. Uh, again, as far as contact goes, we're available 8.30 to uh, 4.30 is general, our office hours. Um, you were in 300 call routes. The call route is just the next building right over on the third floor. You can reach us by phone. You can reach us by email. You can make a Zoom appointment. If the weather is inclement, you don't feel like coming, make a Zoom appointment and we can see you that way as well. So many ways to reach us, okay? So I will tell you, I'll close by saying again, communicate, communicate, communicate. The more you communicate, the oftentimes the better it is for us to be able to kind of provide the right guidance for you. Okay. All right. Well, welcome and have a great semester and hopefully I'll see you all sometime or the other. Well, thank you very much, Hirsch, for all that information. Um, next, I would like to introduce my colleague, Gustavo Flores Macias, who is Associate Vice Provost for International Affairs and Professor of Government and Public Policy. Gustavo will discuss the critical topics of Cornell values and academic integrity. Gustavo. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're doing well. I um, remember fondly, I mean, I'm an internet or was an international student, and I remember fondly my uh, orientation when I first came to the US. I hope you're having a, a good orientation, a helpful orientation too. And uh, as I'm sure you've heard a lot of what you hear today, it might seem, yeah, you know, I might need that at some point, but it's a lot of information right now. So it's, it's good that you will have a lot of these resources for reference and go back to them. And we're always here to help you if there's something you forget. So please do get in touch. Um, I have the pleasure of talking to you about two uh, very important things, at least in my view. The first one has to do with Cornell's values. And the second has to do with academic integrity. Um, so I'll start with the first one, the, the Cornell's core values, and I'd like to just uh, walk you through them, both the values and the code of academic integrity you can find online. They're really easy to find. I'll show some um, websites at the end that you can, again, turn to for reference. But let me go over these values first. 
I'll mention the value and I'll give you just a little bit of what we mean by it. And again, this you can find online. The first value has to do with purposeful discovery, right? By this, we mean the value uh, that, you know, we, we value the process of discovery through learning, um, teaching, scholarship, innovation, and, and striving with integrity for excellence and purpose. And right? so purposeful discovery. The second value is free and open inquiry and expression. By this, we mean that we value free and open inquiry and expression. These are tenets that underlie academic freedom, even of ideas that some may consider wrong or offensive. The third one is a community of belonging. As a university founded to be a place where any person can find instruction, we value diversity and inclusion, and we strive to be a welcoming, caring, and equitable community. The fourth one is exploration across boundaries. That is, we value the importance of all academic disciplines, and we celebrate the power of connections among them. The fifth is changing lives through public engagement. We value the engagement in our community, our state, the, the broader world, learning about their needs and strengths, and applying the knowledge uh, that we create for the benefit of society, so global society. And the last one is respect for the natural environment. We value our role in advancing solutions for a sustainable future, and we recognize the close relationship between people and the earth acting in ways to live and work sustainably. So these are Cornell's six core values. These, we can think of these as guiding principles. These are, these are principles that uh, we fall back or we, we go back to whenever we find challenging situations. Some of them might be competing to some extent in nature. Uh, in the day-to-day, -day, it's easy to get lost. And, and these uh, values are, again, guidelines. We think of this as, as our our, our north when in doubt as to what we need to be relying on. I'd like to pause on the second one that I mentioned, and that is free and open inquiry and expression, right? So I said that this meant that we're a community um, whose very purpose is the pursuit of knowledge, right, as a university. And we value free and open inquiry and expression. And again, uh, these are important tenets that underlie academic freedom. and. I also want to emphasize, even when we're facing ideas that some may consider wrong or offensive, and inherent in this commitment, and I think this is important, is the corollary freedom to engage in recent opposition to messages to which one objects. Now, the recent opposition here is, is a key aspect. And, and I pause on this one and emphasize this one. This one is, I think, perhaps the most challenging principle here. Uh, if you ask me, the six sound great in the abstract, but then when we're confronted often, and I think this can become very personal in the classroom, some ideas that we would think just are very objectionable. So I think it's important to, to take a step back, think about the importance of open expression, think about the importance of trying to debunk ideas based on evidence and the merit of other ideas, and always trying to do so in a civil manner, right, in a civil fashion. Um, now, the second step or the second stage of what I want to, to share with you today has to do with the glue that, at least in my view, brings or holds together these different core principles, and that is academic integrity. Um, I borrow this quote from Cornell's Code of Academic Integrity, and right? it says, the values most essential to an academic community are grounded on the concept of honesty with respect to the intellectual efforts of oneself and others. And again, this is the code you can find online. I'll share some, some websites or some links at the end. But, but Academic integrity really underlies and, and underpins everything we do at Cornell. I think it's useful to think of academic integrity as fairness to oneself and to others. Um, maybe a more sort of practical way to think about this is 
but taking others' ideas can be thought of as stealing. Um, and these are some examples that I have here for you, right? When we don't give proper credit, that is maybe we should be paraphrasing or, or, or quoting, but recognizing where the idea is coming from. Um, perhaps when we're engaging in collaborative work, when the assignment was supposed to be individual work, um, or copying a problem set or copying, uh, you know, from an online resource without attribution, um, unduly relying on technology during exams, reproducing or selling course materials. These are just some examples. There are others. Now, well, how do we get around this, or how should we then proceed? Um, you know, I, I, I encourage everybody to become familiar with best practices, and this is something that every discipline has different ways in which this is done correctly. But, but just more at the most general level, I think it's always just to err on the side of giving more information about where ideas are coming from than less. And some ways in which we can do this, even in the way that, that we, you know, in conversation or written work, you know, I agree with so-and-so, or as so-and-so has argued, or according to some critics, and you might mention them, or in written work, we might include in a, a footnote, uh, some statement of, of debt, right, who we might be indebted to. And some examples here, this explanation is a close paraphrase of blank, right, so-and-so on the pages, or I have used the examples as close by uh, blank. The main steps in my discussion were suggested by so-and-so's treatment of the problem, or perhaps although the examples are my own, my categories are derived from blank. And these have to do with different levels of borrowing, let's say, or different levels of engagement with someone's idea um, and recognizing that level of engagement and the level of borrowing. Now, Something interesting about the code of academic integrity is that it really applies to everybody the second we get here, right? It, it really applies to everyone upon arrival. And it's not only, it doesn't only apply during coursework. So this is something that, that applies to everybody at Cornell, the entire com Cornell community all the time. I wanna mention briefly what happens when there's a violation of academic integrity and when someone is accused of a violation. And there's typically a hearing. And, this is not to scare you, but to give you insight to sort of perhaps a little bit demystify the process, but also show you what it is like and, and ideally help you not end up in this situation yourself. Um, it's a process that is or can be very complicated, uh, but I know that it's definitely a process that can take a, a heavy toll uh, on students and sometimes instructors as well, uh, emotional toll, academic toll. Um, what happens is that when someone is accused of a uh, violation of academic integrity, there is a first hearing in which sort of there's, uh, you know, evidence presented. Um, if, if the student decides to challenge the um, accusation, then uh, this goes to a board and every college has its own board of academic integrity. I serve on this board for arts and sciences uh, over the last three years. And, um, you know, it is very interesting. I'll get to this in a second, but often this has to do not because of some, you know, uh, oh, I, I really just wanted to cheat and I wanted to, to get around things. And it's just time management often, right? It's just the finding oneself in a very tough situation um, with lots of pressure and deadlines accumulating and so on. So I'll get to this in a second, but this is in my experience, something that uh, happens quite a bit. And if a student is found in violation of academic integrity, uh, what typically happens is that the grades are affected. It can be the grade for the course, but it can also uh, warrant some non-grade based disciplinary action, right? So maybe in more, more extreme cases. Um, this may have significant consequences, not only for, say, your standing at Cornell, but perhaps even beyond as this goes on your record. A few tips, I think this is, these are important. Hopefully you, you take this away. If there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this presentation, it's these tips, you know. Um, 
Information is really important. Having the right information, making sure expectations are clear. If expectations are not clear, please ask. Ask the TA, the teaching assistant, ask instructors, ask colleagues, come to us and ask. We can help you find answers to your questions. Ask if you're not sure how to attribute ideas correctly, become familiar with best practices. And like I said, time management is absolutely crucial. Right? If you're falling behind, ask for help as soon as you find yourselves falling behind. There's, um, I think, quite a bit of importance in, um, let's say, the growth that comes from failing and having that mindset that even if I am, quote unquote, failing in an assignment, uh, this can bring so much intellectual growth that uh, comes from struggling through problems and challenges. And this is so much better than finding yourself in a hearing of uh, violation of academic integrity. Please keep the big picture in mind. One assignment or something you fell behind, uh, maybe uh, you didn't do well, that's, that's fine. Keep the big picture, maybe the course as a whole. Again, start looking for help, come to us. Um, these are some resources. How to recognize and avoid plagiarism some citation styles, again, depending on your discipline, this may or may not be super relevant, but, you, but we ask you that you ask within your discipline um, what the best practices are, what, should be, what you should be looking for. And then uh, I have here also the guidelines for students, right? Sort of these guidelines for academic integrity for the entire university that please uh, do take a look. I, I wanted to show you here what is called the Essential Guide to Academic Integrity at Cornell. I think this is uh, before when they actually printed these manuals and handed them out to students. I don't think we're doing that these days anymore, but this is what the manual at least uh, looks like. And, and um, you can find this online. But please do come to us if you're unsure as to who to ask, whom to ask about best practices in your department, in your field, your advisors. If you're not finding the answers that you need, please do come to us and, and we can help you find those answers. We really don't want to see anybody in a situation of a hearing or, or a violation of academic integrity. I'm going to stop here. And I think we might have a minute or two just for, for any questions um, that might come up. I know this sounds straightforward. You'd be surprised when push comes to shove. Uh, a lot of people said, well, I thought I knew how to cite, but uh, you know, I, clearly I didn't. So please do double check. Second, you know, I know exactly what the rules are. I just found myself so stressed and, and pressed for time. And I thought it would be okay. I thought it was just sort of benign. Uh, it turned out that it maybe wasn't, right? Um, I. I really hope that you have a wonderful start of your stay here at Cornell. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, and again, if if any of this, you know, down the road, you think, oh yeah, I remember, you know, they mentioned something along these lines in my orientation. Please do get in touch. I mean, we're always very happy to to hear from you. And and best of luck with the start of the semester. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo, uh, for that information. Really appreciate it. Please do, again, be in touch if you have questions. Um, but now we are going to talk about two very important themes um, at Cornell, universities around the United States, and I think just U.S. society in general, and those are inclusion and wellness. So I'm happy to welcome uh, two people from uh, the Dean of Students Office. We have Greta Kenny, Senior Associate Dean of Students for Student Support and Advocacy Services, and Nancy Martinson, Interim Senior Associate Dean of Students. Thank you both for being here. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having us. Um, as, as Brandon said, my name is Greta Kenny. I serve as Senior Associate Dean of Student Support and Advocacy Services. And broadly, we do 
just what that sounds like. We support students um, who maybe are navigating challenging situations and really serve as a central hub to connect uh, students to resources, whether that's on campus or off campus. Hello, everyone. My name is Nancy Martinson. I'm the Interim Senior Associate Dean of Students. I oversee the Diversity and Inclusion Portfolio. I'm also the proud advisor for the International Student Union, um, and so I get to work with international students um, as part of my role. I'm so excited to have you here. Welcome. Um, something else I wanted to say, Gustavo, who is just here, I actually, the last time I saw him was on PBS, like he was an expert for them, and so you have some VIPs presenting to you today present company included in the VIP term. Um, but yeah, welcome to Cornell. Um, just a, a fun fact, uh, my father is in the military, so I moved around a lot. So I've lived in the Philippines. I've also lived in Turkey. Um, and I studied abroad in a summer program in Zambia. And then Greta, you've done some study abroad. I was an international student. I did my graduate work at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So not obviously here, but I went through similar orientations over there that y'all are going through. All right. So um, just kind of take a pulse. Who in here has studied in the United States before? All right. Okay, a couple of you. And then who, this is your first time studying in the United States. Oh, okay, the most of you. All right, those of you who studied in the United States, raise your hand again. All right, so turn and look at these folks. You all are beautiful, you're lovely, but these are people who've experienced this already. And so these are good resources for you to have. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Hopefully you're all friendly. You raise your hand, I'm sure you are. Um, but th this is a good opportunity for you to just recognize like, hey, you've been through this before. I have some questions. Can you help me understand? I had this encounter, it felt funky. Can you help me understand what happens or offer some more context? And so that's honestly what this first part is, is we're just gonna give you a little more context. Um, and then how many of you speak two or more languages? Okay, how about three or more languages? Four or more languages? Five or more languages? Whoa, okay, dang, that's impressive. Okay, um, so in the United States, Americans, only about 20% of Americans speak two or more languages. And so um, I personally think when it comes to international students, that's the coolest thing about you all is your ability to just go in and out of languages, um, your ability to think in different languages and offer different perspectives, I think is such a valuable asset to our campus. Um, and then in regard to coming here, just also something to think through. I know most of you are like, I'm, I'm older, I'm an adult, um, but sometimes you get homesick and that's A-OK. -okay. And so I always want to encourage you, although this is going to be your new home for the next semester um, or longer, I encourage you to reach back out to your old home. Um, and something that happens, there's a building called 626 Thurston. Um, that's just the name of it. We don't have a fancy name on the building. It's just called 626 Thurston. But every first Fridays from three to five, we do a postcard event where you can literally write as many postcards if you have 17 family members and friends that you want to talk to and just tell them about how you're doing at Cornell we'll give you a free Cornell postcard you write it out and we'll mail it to you um, for you um, so just know that's an opportunity that happens every first Friday from three to five at 626 Thurston um <laughs> And then in regard to weather, our, I'm not going to lie, Ithaca's winter this winter has been fairly calm, knocking on wood. It's been very chill in that it hasn't been super cold outside. But how many of you, um, this will be your first time experiencing snow? Okay. All right, a couple of you. Um, so uh, um, in regard to experiencing snow for the first time, it really is all about having the correct gear. So as long as you have jacket and you're bundling up and you have a hat and gloves and stuff I promise you you're going to be okay here um but again ask ask folks if they've experienced snow like you can tell them hey I'm cold <laughs> what am I doing wrong what do I need to be doing don't be shy this is your opportunity to really make sure you're getting the information you need to be successful um for the most part Cornell's pretty good at shoveling our sidewalks and and, and putting salt but there's a couple signs that will say no winter maintenance and just know what that sign means is that they are not shoveling or salting those um, pathways. So you just want to make sure you avoid those pathways so that you can safely get to and from your classes. Um, also, in regard to winter, I think sometimes people think, oh, it's cold. I'm just going to stay in. 
you can do outside um, but when it does snow like play in the snow make a snow angel make a snowman um, there's also winter events there's skiing that's fairly close by and um, there's something called Greek Peak it's about 30 ish minutes away from here and you can go snow tubing snowboarding skiing so take advantage of being outside you don't need to be indoors just because it's snowing and cold so this is our workshop roadmap um, Nancy's going to talk a little bit about culture shock. And I know some of you have shared that you've been in the U.S. before. Um, but, you know, just some of the nuances of, of what you might be able to anticipate. Then living in the American context, right? Nancy is, um, as she said, the leader of the diversity and inclusion portfolio. So we're going to talk a little bit about gender inclusivity, Black Lives Matter, anti-Asian racism, some things that are kind of happening um, across the country. And then I'll talk uh, about mental wellness and getting connected. And so in regard to culture shock, um, just, just like in your country, not everyone is the same. So when I talk about some of these things here, not all Americans are the same. I'm just bringing up some nuances that you might experience. So I really want to make sure that you understand I'm not speaking on behalf of every single American you're going to run into. Um, these are just some things that you might be like, wait, what's happening? What's going on here? Um, so that's what we're, we're going to talk about right now. Just things to be more mindful of. All right, so the first one is small talk. And again, for those of you who studied in the US, you might, yeah, feel free to just feel like, yo, this is real, this happens. Um, so in regard to small talk, I think for the most part, we tend to be pretty friendly in that we just, we're not good in silence. And so um, when we first meet somebody, we'll often talk about the number one thing, especially in Ithaca is weather. We can't help it. We just love talking about the weather all the time. I literally was just talking about the weather as part of this presentation. That's how ingrained it is in our culture to talk about about weather. Um, and I remember I was speaking with a, a past president from the International Student Union, and I asked her, what is one thing she's not going to miss because she's graduating? And she was like, small talk. Why do you all do it? What's the point of this? I don't understand it. And she's like, you all talk about the weather like, oh, it's raining outside. Yes, I was just outside. I'm fully aware it was raining outside. Now we're inside. And she just didn't understand why we constantly talked about that. So weather is something that's pretty popular. We like to talk about sports. It's the Super Bowl right now. So you'll probably come across a lot of people who might have some upsets or might be celebrating come tomorrow in regard to whatever happens in the football games going on. Um, something else, uh, again, we're, we're not good at silence. And so you might see us when we are waiting for an elevator. Sometimes we can't just wait for the elevator. We have to be like, wow, this elevator is taking a long time, huh? And you're just like, why are you saying that? <laughs> like, yes, it is. I'm, I'm also waiting for the elevator. I'm, I'm aware it's taking a long time. We're just not good at silence. And so sometimes we fill the silence with something. So bear with us. It can, it can feel awkward if you're not used to it, but it is something that we tend to do. Um, in regard to small talk to topics to avoid, we do not talk about politics um, just because in the United States, we're very polarized in regard to our politics and you never know how someone, what someone believes. And so that's a topic we don't, that's not part of our small talk. We let that go. <laughs> um, something else we tend not to talk about is religion, same concept. We don't know what people practice. And so that's not a common thing we'll just bring up. And then money. Um, in some cultures, it's not a big deal at all to share how much money you make at your job. Um, here in the US, we're kind of private about our money. That's not something that we would necessarily talk about. Something else I want to talk about is hookup culture. Um, so some cultures may be surprised about our dating apps and how quickly people progress in their relationships here. Um, again, this is not all Americans. There are definitely some who are more conservative, but there are some who may be a little more liberal com in comparison to what you may be used to. Um, and so literally there's a ton of dating apps um, in in our culture for you to choose from, if that is something that you're interested in doing. But I think, yeah, something that can be really surprising is people being really upfront about what it is they want on these dating apps. Um, and, I, and I think in engaging with some students, they are just shocked, like, wait, what are they asking? Or what are they doing? Or what's happening here? Um, and again, depending on where you're from, that might be really exciting. Like, okay, yeah, let's get straight to the point. Or it might be like, whoa, what is happening here? We just met, slow down. Um, so I just want to prepare you for that. Um, I also want to mention that Cornell does have a consensual relationship policy um, affirming just graduate student relationships um, in regard to other folks in what is um, ethically appropriate and what is prohibited. And so that is something else that you can look up if you are interested in learning more about that. 
Um, and then the last culture shock thing I want to mention is tipping. Um, I think that this can be a big culture shock for folks. In the United States, unfortunately, we tend not to pay our wait staff an affordable wage and that they depend on our tipping to make an affordable wage. Um, and so when you go out to eat, it is typically common for um, us to, I'd say 15 to 20% is typically how much we tip. Um, if we really like someone, then we'll do like 25% or higher. Um, but I think that can be pretty shocking because um, I think in other countries, maybe you'll just do a little bit if if that if, if that's something that you do. But here it is we depend on it. It's something that you do. Even at a cafe, it's very typical, even if you're just buying one coffee to tip like a dollar. Um, and that can be a surprise for some folks. In regard, or in that same vein, when you go to a store and you buy something, we have sales tax. So even though on the price tag, it says it's $9.99, you have $10 in your pocket, you do not have enough money for that item. So we have sales tax. So even though it says $9.99, you're probably going to pay like 1037. So that also can be something that really kind of surprised some students coming in here is like, wait, what's this extra money that I need to pay? Um, so I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. All right, American context. All right, so um, as you're arriving to the United States, you may see on the news some things about what's going on here. Um, and again, some of that might be kind of scary or might be kind of shocking, or perhaps your countries are going through similar things. Um, and so this next part is really just to kind of give you some more context about what's happening within the United States. Um, as I mentioned, there is a polarization in between our different um, political groups. Um, there's a lot of legislation and laws that's being introduced that have upset people on both sides. Um, and so one of the most recent things is um, the reversal of Roe versus Wade. Um, the main thing about this law is that, or that a lot of people are paying attention to, there's many aspects of this law, but one of the primary things that Americans are focused on is this idea of legalizing abortion. And so in some of your countries, that laws around that may be more strict or more lenient. But here in the United States, this is a hot topic that we're talking about right now. And, and again, many people feel many different things about it. And you'll come across that here in the United States. You'll hear some people talk about it. Again, not through small talk, but through more in-depth conversations, you'll hear people talk about that. Something else I want to bring up is that race is a social construct. Um, in the United States, we put a lot of emphasis on race. When we meet somebody, it's very important. To, okay, I see you. I need to put you in a box. Where? What box do I put you in? And if you're coming from a country um, in which race is not as emphasized, it can feel really funky and, and can be a little confusing. Um, but it is something that, yeah, we we tend to do. When we look at someone, we need to know where we put them, and we'll say it out loud. And you didn't ask us, but we're going to assign this to you. This is something that kind of tends to happen. Um, so an example I like to give is um, I was speaking with some international students who are from India, and they're South Asian, and they were saying how, like, people were telling them, like, oh, you're brown. And they're like, what? What does that mean? I've never been called brown before. What are you talking about? Or that you're the brown Asians. And they're like, I'm Indian. I don't, what are you saying? And so again, it's this assignment that people are giving to you. Um, for those who identify as Afro-Latino, Afro-Caribbean, African, um, in the United States, we tend to kind of diminish your identity and just label you black. That's what you are. And that can be really hard for folks because like, no, I have a really rich culture and it includes these other components. Um, and so that's something that can be a, a bit of a culture shock for folks. Um, another example I like to talk about is that, um, if you're from the Middle East, which box do you check? I think oftentimes people from the Middle East will check white, but geographically, you're Asian, so what, but great, do you identify as Asian? Like, so right, it's very confusing, which, what are you? And in the US, those are conversations that we're having. We're gonna assign you to something, whether you believe it or not. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of pushing back and, and conversations you're gonna have about your own identity formation here in the United States. And, and you get to disagree and you get to fight <laughs> for what you believe you are and you get to have those conversations. But I just wanna warn you, this is something that tends to happen here. All right, inclusivity, the first thing we're gonna talk about is inclusivity in regard to gender. 
Um, so Corm Cornell University is committed to creating a safe and respectful campus for all members of our community, including those of all gender identities. Um, so a very easy way we do that is by being mindful of pronouns. Um, and so in the United States, it's very popular for, or in a college setting more specifically, it's very popular for us to be like, hi, my name is Nancy Martinson. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and again, if you've never seen that or heard that before, it may be a little peculiar, like, wait, why they do that? But it's our way of being inclusive. It's our way of just kind of sharing. This is how you can identify me as. If you were on a Zoom, I know on my Zoom, it has Nancy Martinson, comma, she, her. Um, that's just part of my Zoom name. Um, so again, it's a very kind of common practice that we have here in a college setting. Um, and then thinking through inclusive language, um, in regard to if folks don't identify as either male or female, when someone is identifying themselves as non-binary or gender non-conforming, um, that can be kind of a new practice for folks. And so in the US, they is actually can be used as a singular pronoun. So I can be like, oh, this is Greta. Um, they live in a really cute house. And that's not weird, even though I said they, and this is Greta. So they can be used as um, a singular pronoun. Um, and also in just thinking about language, um, if you are, I was gonna say from the Latinx community, that's an example. Um, you can use the term Latin A, Latinx, Latin with an at sign, A, -A um, are examples of recognizing non-binary, non-gender conforming folks. I'm Filipina, any Filipinas in the house? Oh, sorry, I'm okay to be the only, but in the Filipino language, um, to be more inclusive, we'll say Filipinix. Um, and so there's also ways um, in which we'll be more conclusive. But again, depending on your culture, this may, this may be new. You may never heard of this before, um, but this, these are conversations that are happening um, within this college setting. Um, and then these are just some pictures of a different student organization, specifically when the, within the graduate community, um, and just kind of recognizing not only the LGBTQ community, but just kind of recognizing that there's some inequities in regard to what fields women go into, and how can we empower women and help make sure that they are in more represented in a, in a broad array of different fields. I know, I'm so tired. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, in July of 2020, the university president, Martha Pollack, issued a statement in recognition of the historic racialized violence in the United States and acknowledged that our university community must think and act holistically to change cultures and systems that inherently privilege some more than others. And so the Cornell Graduate School has affirmed their commitment to students whose background has led them to be historically excluded from and underrepresented in the academia as a result of systemic injustice. All right, Han, I need to take a water break. Wait, that? Does anyone have any questions for Nancy so far? Okay. You're doing great. Thanks. Okay. All right. So um, in this next slide, Black Lives Matter, um, this is an organization in the summer of 2020, there was actually Black Lives Matter marches globally across the world. And so maybe even in your home country, you may have seen these marches happen. You may have participated in them. Um, you may know someone who participated in them. Um, they do happen here in the United States. And specifically, the focus is to intervene in violence inflicted on Black communities. And one focus within that is police brutality. Um, I've come across international students who identify as black or are identified by us as black. And this is something that, that they have to be mindful of, that they, they need to recognize is that coming into the US, you are racialized as black. Um, and so this is a, a, a community of, or a, what's the word I'm looking for? This is like a charge. Um, this, is a, this is a group of folks to really kind of bring to our attention what's happening within this community. Um, this doesn't just focus on police brutality. This also um, looks at racial inequities, um, especially regarding COVID, um, how this community was treated or what access or limited access they had. Um, this also has to do with job disparities. So this is literally looking at the quality of life here in the United States and bringing attention to that in hopes of making changes. 
Um, there has been Black Lives Matter organi organizing on campus and President Pollock has made a statement in support of black students. Um, and there are specific clubs and organizations that focus on activism and supporting the black community. Um, two specific ones is Cornell for Black Lives and BSU, which stands for Black Students United. Next one is anti-Asian racism. Um, I have come across international students who are Asian and they're like, Nancy, I'm scared. Um, what I've seen on the news, what happens to Asians here? Is this gonna happen to me? Um, what's going on? What does this look like? And it's true that around the world, Asians served as a scapegoat for COVID, which resulted in an increase in anti-Asian racism and violence. Um, there was something that happened in March of 2021 where there was a shooting in, um, Atlanta, Georgia, um, and it resulted in the murder of six Asian females, um, which really kind of brought um, attention to hyper awareness of Asian women being sexual, sexually fetishized. Um, and so then this, this concept of like, dang, do people only want to date me because I'm Asian? What does this mean? What does this look like? A lot of questions came from that. Um, and that may not just be an American thing, that, that can actually be globally. Um, Asian women are, are thinking through this. Um, but most recently, last night, there was a shooting um, that happened in California in which the Asian community was targeted. And so gun violence is also something that tends to happen here in the United States. Ooh, there is a center called the Asian Asian American Center. Um, again, it's located in 626 Thurston. So tomorrow at 6 p.m., they're kind of having a, a community healing space for anybody who identifies as Asian and just wants to come together and just kind of talk about what's happening. You are more than welcome to join that. Um, and you can also follow us on social media. A3C, Cornell, Cornell A3C is our Instagram handle. Um, another thing is the model minority myth. The model minority myth su supports the concept that simply by being born Asian, you're automatically smart um, and that you don't struggle with anything, that you're doing really well. And it's true. I saw some of you smiling. It's true. So what that means is like when um, an Asian student is in, I don't, I'm not really smart, but like calculus, what's the highest calculus class? Four, is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> but, I don't know. Okay, but the highest calculus class. So when you have an Asian student in the highest calculus class and you're like, hey, what is this? You just expect them to know. Like, you're Asian. Of course you know the answer to this. Help me out. What is this answer? And if they don't know, there's a certain guilt that they feel like, dang, people just expect me to know this. I don't know the answer. I don't know what this is. Um, and so it sounds good. Like, oh, the model minority myth. That sounds great. But it puts a, an additional pressure on students to perform. Um, that's really just not fair. Um, and so that's also something that students here can combat with is, is just this concept that you don't need help with anything and that you're good to go, which again, is, is not really a fair thing to assume. Um, so in general, you can empower yourself by being more mindful of general safety and surroundings. Um, if ever you don't feel safe, just yeah, walk with a buddy. Um, also, Cornell has the Guardian app, which is really helpful if you haven't taken advantage of it. Um, you should download it. Um, I am a resource. Garda is a resource. As a student here, you do not need to experience anything alone. There are a bunch of resources offered on campus. Understandably, as a new student, you're like, Nancy, this is so much information that I received just today. Um, but kind of what Gustavo said, you don't need to know all the things, you just need to know the people who know it. Ask for help and then we'll reconnect you to whatever resources that you need. Okay, strong work, Nancy. Drink some water. All right, so wanna talk a little bit for a couple minutes about kind of mental wellness, community, um, and, oh, thank you. Um, and and um, how to navigate what will, understandably be a stressful time for you as graduate and professional students here at Cornell. So I think there's this, right, there's this assumption or expectation that things are linear, right? And I think this can go for all sorts of things in our lives that we have a goal and we're just going to start out and it's going to be linear. But there's the the reality of it, right, is there are fits and starts and, and things will dip down. Um, and so this is kind of my, my version of like Instagram version versus reality, like real life version, right? So there's this... Um, uh, great image here, um, the good, the bad, and the in-between as it relates to stress. And I think um, most of us probably know um, that there, that a 
a fair amount of stress is actually good and healthy, right? It can be motivating. It can help us focus. Um, but as you see kind of on this bell curve, on the other side of it, when we get to the quote bad stress, we have exhaustion, anxiety, panic, anger, and then breakdowns. And so that's what I think of as the, the kind of space that burnout occupies. And so hoping to just get y'all thinking about what does it mean to, to be successful but also be grounded and be connected to resources so that I'm not kind of um, on, a, on a path towards that burnout. Mm -hmm. Allostatic load refers to the cumulative burden um, of chronic stress and life events. And so again, this is something that we all experience. Um, and, and really the goal, as you can see on this image is to be at that kind of good stress peak. This is another way of thinking about it, another visual for it. So we've got thriving. I've got this, like I just landed. I'm excited. I'm motivated. I'm ready to go. Surviving. I'm doing the thing, but something isn't quite right. Struggling. I can't keep this up. And then in crisis, I can't survive this, right? And and you can see there are um, some more specific uh, nuances in each one of those categories. Um, and so I think what I'm asking you all to, to maybe make a commitment is to be checking in with yourself, right? So like, how am I doing? Do those self-assessments with some regularity. Um, of course, there are going to be good weeks and bad weeks and good days and good classes and stressful, you know, stressful times as well. And so if we can get into this, this kind of regular pattern or habit of doing that self-assessment, then you can see kind of outside of yourself, your little warning signs, if that makes sense about like, Hey, last week I was feeling good, but my check-in this week, you know, I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating, I, you know, feel like the workload is too much, then then what do we do with that check-in, right? That's the next question. Nancy actually asked this great question um, to colleagues and students. Um, she says, what's your telltale sign that like, you're no longer thriving. You're in a like stressful place. And so I'm going to ask you all that question. Anybody want to share? Nancy, you want to share first? Um, so my sign is if I fall asleep on the couch, like if I pass out on the couch at like eight or nine, that's my sign because I am I love routine. I love knowing that typically around 10 o'clock, I turn my TV off, I wash any dishes, I brush my teeth, wash my face, like I'm in bed by 1030 and like out. So if I'm falling asleep on my couch, I'm not doing my routine. That's my tell. Something's happening here. I'm not, I'm not on top of my stuff the way I normally am. Anybody want to share? Try to put you on the spot. Yeah, go ahead. Don't get a workout in in a week's time. That's great. And that's, a you know, one of the things we're going to talk about in a few minutes are like, what are the supports? What are the, uh, what are the outlets that we have? And so exercise is a great example of, of a, a kind of coping strategy for physical and mental health. Great. So there's a whole bunch of research that indicates that social support and connectedness mitigates mental health stress, and it's a protective factor. And so, um, again, there's all sorts of research that links a student's sense of belonging, including perceived social support, acceptance, and connectedness on campus to well-being and persistence in college. I think that um, at institutions of higher education, including Cornell, and maybe especially Cornell being an Ivy League institution, there's this constant, like, I got to do it all, I got to do it all, I got to do it all, right? And if we're burning the candle at two ends of the two, en what is that saying? Both ends, burning the candle at both ends. Thank you. I thought there was a noun at the end of it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Um, 
And if we're not doing things like sleeping, eating, working now, drinking water, then it's actually going to take a toll on our academic success and our sense of connectedness and belonging here. And so regular and healthy interpersonal contact with friends, family, classmates, faculty, and staff provide an important sense of social connectedness for students. These are some resources. I wanna start by acknowledging, particularly when we talk about mental health, that here in the US, within you know particular cultural communities and understandably at different uh, countries across the world, there may be stigma associated with accessing mental health care. Um, and so I wanna acknowledge that that is real and that is an absolute, um, kind of contributing factor, whether or not folks feel like they can reach out and ask for help. Um, but here in you know the US, I think we're seeing the, the kind of tides turn related to this and particularly here at Cornell as well. Um, we've just adopted what's called the Okanagan Charter, which is a, um, commitment to be a health promoting campus and that's both physical and mental health. And we're really doing um, a lot of work to increase help seeking behaviors. And so again, this is that notion of like, I do the self assessment, I recognize I'm struggling. Okay, who, who and where do I go to ask for help? And so in terms of connectedness, this first link, there are over a thousand student organizations on campus. Um, a huge number of those are dedicated, particularly for graduate and professional students. The Graduate School, the Office of Inclusion and Student Engagement is a great resource. There's information here about the broader Ithaca community. And then Cornell Health also, like I said, may be a resource for you. And then this is a, oh, has anyone seen the Big Red Barn yet? Yes. So this is a picture of the Big Red Barn. There are over 400 social events just for graduate and professional students at the Big Red Barn uh, during the year. And so this is a great space where you can go meet people, go with friends you already have, kick back, have fun, relax, and develop community. And then I would say that undergraduate students really tend not to be in that space. So that really is your space to, to be social and, and be with each other and be in community as a grad student and professional student. Absolutely. So I kind of covered a little bit about this, but right, well-being is considered an important part of overall health care. Um, I think this is about 20%. I think it's a little bit higher than 20% now of students seek uh, services each year at Cornell Health Counseling and Psycho um, Cornell Health Center, which you'll see below. It says CAPS 24 7. CAPS stands for Counseling and Psychological Services. That um, number during business hours connects to the office. You can get connected, set up an appointment, learn about other options like group therapy or uh, a program called Lex Talk, which is just drop in opportunities. But that also is a 24 7. Um, so if you're, you know, really struggling and it's three o'clock in the morning, Morning, that's a great resource. Um, the next number here is Cornell University, University Dispatch Center, and that um, connects if you wanted to connect with what's called an administrator on call. And so those folks are not mental health counselors, not clinicians, so it's not therapy. But if you're struggling with, um, you know, stress, or if you have a kind of imminent situation. If you live off campus and you have a flood at your apartment and you have to vacate and you have nowhere to go, then this is when you would call and ask to get connected to the administrator on call. We, I lead that team and we work hard um, to support students who navigate all sorts of crisis situations and we can get you set up, for example, in emergency housing if you did have a flood or a fire at your apartment, for example. Student Disability Services is another great resource. They're situated um, within Cornell Health as well. They work to ensure all aspects of students' academic um, life are accessible, equitable, and inclusive. Um, they also recognize a variety of approaches to documentation and do a really great job of not kind of medicalizing disability. And so recognize that 
we all have varying abilities, whether that's, you know, physical abilities, learning disabilities. They also do really great work um, in the space of if you've experienced a traumatic event, right? So maybe, again, like you have a fire at your off-campus apartment, maybe that's a traumatic event. You need to kind of disconnect for a couple of days from classes. Student Disability Services is gonna be a great resource um, to support you and also connect with your faculty. Um, I think over, what do I have here? 4,000 students last year were registered with Student Disability Services. And so it's a great, um, again, a great resource and really working hard to destigmatize that support space. So how will you be connected? Like Nancy said earlier, you know, this is not your first rodeo. You may be landing here in the US for the first time, but you've done an undergraduate degree. What are your sources of connection? <laughs> We're all very isolated. <laughs> I think this is a this is a space, you know. Um, I've heard from colleagues who've, you know, heard from students who are international in some of these early days connections in some of these spaces were really instrumental for folks. And so, like Nancy said, we just encourage you all to, you know, not be shy, whether it's reaching out to resources, you know, the folks that have presented, but also extending, um, extending that, that olive branch to each other and saying like, hey, I've navigated winter before. I've navigated, you know, I, I know where the big red barn is. Are you going to go? Do you want to go? Let's go together. Things like that. Um, and so we just encourage you to really be mindful and intentional um, and kind of, like I talked about earlier, um, implement it into kind of a habit and routine and, and um, in terms of just developing community and connection. Another great resource, caringcommunity.cornell.edu. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Yes. That's a great question. So I can't speak to every single one, but I know that there are these kind of, for lack of a better phrase, like open enrollment kind of opportunities. It's a, it's a like health insurance term, right? <laughs> um, but there are these open enrollment and, and um, kind of, and you'll see like students, what's the word I want? Like student activities fairs and stuff like that that will pop up. Um, I I wonder, and, and I don't have expertise in this space, but I wonder if um, some of the, like obviously, I don't know if this would apply to you all, but like Greek organizations, there's a particular period when students show interest, right? Um, I wonder if there are some uh, timeframes in terms of like academic, Academic community? No, somebody in the room knows. Don't be sure. Correct. You can join all the campus groups. Club Fest on February 5th. Yes. You want to just come up here? I'll hand you the mic. <laughs> 11 to 4, February 5th. Social, more social. Yep. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? And then there's also intramural sports. So if you don't want to get on the like actual Cornell yeah, sports team, there's intramural sports, which are like a calmer, fun way to also meet people and get involved. Okay, you can keep going. 
The graduate school also, um, again, we talked a little bit about them. The link uh, for one of the offices was on a previous slide. They can be really helpful with interpreting policies and requirements, helping you identify your pathway to success. Also another great stop for health and wellness resources, academic or personal concerns, community engagement and concerns with bias or harassment. I've worked with graduate students who have had challenges with their committee chair, for example and we've worked closely with the graduate school to, to help students navigate some of those dynamics. All right, and then this is a picture all the way from 1904 um, that um, was called the Cornell Cosmopolitan Club, which in today's time would be like an international student club. So in 1904, this is, this is a picture of how many international students were at least at, in attendance for this picture. Um, and so just kind of want to indicate that international students have been such an important part of Cornell's campus. Um, and again, just so excited to have you here. You really do bring such a fresh and exciting and different perspective on campus that is so welcomed here. So uh, thank you so much for your attention and attendance and we wish you the best in the rest of your orientation and good luck this semester. Great, thank you so much, uh, Greta. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, we are now going to move to our final presentation before we have our reception. Hot chocolate's gonna be perfect. I think it's the snow queued up perfectly. I think it's about to start, if not already, which actually has me very excited. I know I've been living in Ithaca for too long as so I get really excited about the snow. Talking about the weather again. I would like to introduce Sergeant Justin, um, who's gonna be here to talk to us about um, health and safety. Sergeant Justin, thank you so much for being here. All right, so good afternoon. My name is Justin Haynes. I'm a sergeant with Cornell University Police Department. I've been here for 15 years now. Um, I'm also a canine handler and in charge of our canine program and some various other stuff that you guys really don't need to know about because I only have 20 minutes of your time, so I want to keep you on schedule moving forward. But before I get going, does anybody have any immediate pressing issues, questions uh, that they want to ask about the police department? All right, we'll wait till I get through the slide, and then if you got something in the meantime, shoot your hand up, and uh, we'll go from there. <clears throat> All right, so Cornell University Police is under the Division of Public Safety. We're a fully staffed organization of 48 um, or 50 officers sworn. We've got a major investigations unit, two canine units, a crime prevention unit. We're located at Barton Hall. Are you guys familiar where Barton Hall is at all? So if you're not familiar, it's next to the Statler Hotel. It's right across the street. And at the bottom, you'll see that we're IACLEA accredited agency, which means that that's an outside agency that comes in and looks at our policies and procedures and makes sure that Cornell University Police Department is following those policies and procedures. Uh, it holds us to a higher standard and not all um, university police departments have that seal of approval. So a little bit inside of Barton Hall, again, like I said, it's Cornell Police Headquarters. It's also the Division of Public Safety Dispatch Center. And inside that dispatch center, they will receive emergency and non-emergency phone calls. They also do the emergency mass notification system. They watch over the RAVE mobile guardian app. And they, on top of that, will dispatch various agencies for the fire and burglar alarms, whether it's CU, EMS, EHS, or CUPD. And then if you guys lose anything throughout the years uh, while you're here, if it gets turned into Cornell Police or Cornell Lost and Found, it's also inside Barton Hall. This is Chief Bellamy. He's got his own slide. He's been our chief now since April of last, well, last spring, essentially, so almost a year. In his short term as chief of police for CUPD, he's done more for our department than any of the previous chiefs have done in his position. So if you guys have questions about that later on, we can circle back. But a phenomenal man gets his 15 seconds of fame through that slide. Uh, I wish I could give him more. That's how highly we think of him. 
So as I was talking to you earlier, in charge of the canine program, I got to do a selfless plug and throw that up there. Uh, the black lab is canine axle. The little German short hair pointer um, on your right, left, excuse me, is Luna. She is my canine partner. She um, is all of that and then some as far as what she can do for the capabilities of the university and the police department. So why we have a canine program is anytime a dignitary, foreign president, um, or high-ranking official comes to the university, they work with the Secret Service. The Secret Service requires that we have an explosive detection canine on site to sweep the motorcade, the venues, um, and overall safety for them. Outside of that, we also use our canine program for large events, large gatherings. We do a preemptive sweep before and then during. They're explosive detection canines, so that's their major in terms of an academic setting. Um, so they have a major, they also have a minor, right? Their minor is article recovery and searching for lost uh, individuals. So if we have a lost student, community member, wanders off in the woods, gets lost somewhere, our dogs will search for that person. Any question about the dogs? Does somebody here want to pet them? All right, we'll talk about that later. As for our department and training, um, we go through a police academy like any other law enforcement agency in the uh, state of New York or in the country. It's a six to eight month academy. They then come back here after their time at the academy where they go through another four months of field training and uh, field training. So they're shadowed by an additional officer and they'll go through the geography, the paperwork, the vehicle and traffic phase. They'll spend some time in the specialty unit, which is investigations, crime prevention, and dispatch to learn the intricacies of all that. And then at the end, they're chaperoned or shadowed for a previous two weeks. So when you guys are out and about walking through, if you see uh, a team of two officers teamed up, one looks older, one looks a lot younger, odds are that's probably individuals going through the field training portion. All right, some different ways you can make contact with CUPD or the dispatch center if you need anything is you can always call the 607-255-1111. That's a direct line to the dispatch center, which will then dispatch CUPD. 911 is up there. If you guys are in case of emergency, you panic, and all you can remember is 911, that'll get you the same results. However, that goes to Tompkins County uh, 911 Center. They then relay the information back to us at CUPD and then we respond from there. If you want, you can come in person to Barton Hall if you have to file a report that someone stole your lost item or you're being harassed or followed or anything of that nature, we can always take those in person. Uh, if you're in a situation where you find yourself, <clears throat> I don't know, say being followed by someone or someone's making you nervous or something is off, if you walk around the university, you'll see that there's blue lights uh, throughout the university on the street and in buildings. If you directly hit that button on that blue light, that runs directly into the dispatch center. So that's a direct line in case of an emergency. Other ways that you can contact us if you don't want a face-to-face -face with an officer or don't feel that it's pressing uh, pressing situation that you need immediate response. You can always file a report through the Rave Mobile Guardian app. You can use a silent witness form or go on to the website for Cornell University Police Department and on there, there's a form that you can fill out that gets sent in. This is the Rave uh, Guardian app that I just spoke of. Let me look. So there's a QR code. I'll get it out to you guys later on so you can download it if you don't have it. Does anyone have it on their phone currently? Nobody? Okay, so we'll get that to you. But that allows you to do a couple things. It allows you to set a safety timer, provides texting with CUPD. You can directly hit 911 off it. It provides you um, additional university resources as long as safety tips. It's free. It comes out of your tuition. And probably one of the most important things is at night, if you're out walking from, say, central campus back home off campus and you want to set a safety timer or a guardian on there, you can select four, you can select five friends total. We suggest that you put CUPD as one of those friends. You then go and select all your friends on there. You set a timer that says, I'm leaving from central campus back to my resident. That timer will follow your phone and your friends will be able to track you as you go. Why it's important to set CUPD as your guardian on there is if you get back to your home and you forget to shut the timer off, um, 
and then we get an activation that your timer is now expired, we send somebody to your residence or your location based off your GPS to make sure something is okay or make sure everything is okay. So you don't have to set the police department on your uh, timer as a guardian, but we suggest you do because in case of a situation where say you go to set it and it expires, now we're looking for you. Um, otherwise you'll have five friends. So that'll have to come and look for you to deactivate your timer. Here's a couple safety tidbits while you guys are here. Our biggest number one complaint um, is larceny, stealing of people's property. So if you leave stuff unattended, odds are it'll develop legs and it'll walk away eventually at some point. So we always try to encourage you to make sure everything's locked up. Try not to leave everything unattended. If you're sitting at a table in a library studying, you get up to go to the bathroom, as cumbersome as that is, pick your property up, take it with you or leave it with a friend. Um, if you have a friend, you can leave the stuff there. But if you're alone studying, don't leave your property unattended because a lot of times it'll disappear. So on top of that, if you, does anyone have bicycles here? No, nobody? Okay. So we had a flurry of bicycle thefts over the last fall, and I'm sure it'll pick up this spring. So if you have a bicycle, we encourage you to lock it up. Just make sure that your property is secured and safe. Um, additionally, record serial numbers, take photos of all your property. So that way, if it does come up stolen, you can provide the serial numbers and a photo of the property that was stolen. Keep backup information off your phone. So everybody stores their contacts on their phone, right? But make sure that you at least have backup information, backup phone numbers, friends, family, or whoever you generally contact with. In case your phone gets stolen, you have all that information with you. All right, so on here, there's additional things that we have come across over the years that are scams and frauds. Um, this is just general education as far as that goes. But a couple of things to be cognizant of and aware of is a lot of times you'll get individuals that'll call you that say they are an IRS individual. Uh, a lot of the IRS will not call you. They will send you an official documentation through the mail to get a hold of you. So it's just an individual looking for information, trying to get bank account personal information so they then can go online and defund you or defraud you of information. And then, so this little triangle on here is just for, um, in order for a crime to occur, you have to have, the individual has to have the desire to wanna to commit the crime, you have to have the ability and the opportunity, which means if you, I wanna go and steal something and if something's left unattended, you've now just made it easy for me to go and commit the crime. Um, so how you can prevent something from happening is make sure that when you take away one of these avenues or sides of this triangle, essentially. Once you take one away, you've then decreased your chances of being a victim of some sort of theft. Back on to the silent witness form. So that silent witness form, like I was saying earlier, is a way to contact CUPD without a face-to-face -face interaction or talking to somebody on the phone. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can find it on the CUPD website and the address is up there. You can also find it in AVP Honan. Uh, he sends out this blue light message every Friday, it goes into your email, probably will go into your clutter until you look at it, move it over to your inbox, but be aware that that is out there and it goes out to everybody. And then for those that didn't have the Rave app, here's the QR code for the Rave app. So if you wanna take a moment and just scan that on your phone, it's free, comes out of your tuition. Um, you can set it up if you want later on. If you have an iPhone, it should go directly to it. If you have an Android, you have to actually go into your camera, open it up, and then it should download for you. Does everybody get it that wants it? All right, so most importantly, and I know I just rambled on through all of this to try to stay on task, but you guys have been sitting through this all day. So um, your time is valuable. If you take anything away from here, download the Rave Guardian app, uh, realize that CUPD is here for a resource. And if you guys need anything, please reach out to us, let us know. But ultimately, one of the best ways to keep the university safe, keep yourself safe, is you guys see something that looks suspicious, makes you feel uncomfortable, looks out of place, say something.
call us, let us know. Uh, even if you want to report it later on, we can always follow back through. But as simple as that is, if you see something, say something. That's the number one reason, or number one and easiest way to keep yourself safe, but keep your friends safe also. Then if you do decide to call us, uh, what you guys can do to help. Oops, skipping over. So like I just said, be calm. Um, if someone approaches you and tries to steal your property at any point in time, which is highly unlikely statistically, but we throw this out here as just a general caveat, your property isn't worth, it isn't worth your life or you getting harmed by any means. So give them the property, call us, we'll go forward from there. Um, that is generally our little tidbit of safety for you guys. If you find yourself in that situation, remain calm, collectively work yourself through it, and then call CUPD or 911. Yes, sir. So Cornell University is, is safe and it's very well lit. Um, the city of Ithaca, the commons and everything has their little, there's definitely spots that have an uptick due to the lack of law enforcement personnel that the city currently has. If you do your research on it, you will see uh, the spike and everything, but for the most part, it's safe. Just always remember to be with a buddy. Stay, if you're out during late hours, um, stay in an area that's well lit. If you go to a party with a friend, and you want to leave, but your friend, or if you want to stay, but your friend wants to leave, either leave with that friend or find somebody else, but generally don't walk alone. They're not like safety one-on-one tip. You bet. So here's our contact information. We offer a bunch of different trainings um, out there. If you go on our social media, it's on Instagram or Facebook page. We have a sheet of all the programs that we do offer to students and staff that are interested. So if there's anything that I just breezed over, because this presentation probably takes me 45 minutes to an hour, if I'm not talking as fast as I can talk to get it out, um, my email is on here. Reach out to me. If you got another question like the gentleman in the front, then send me an email. I'll answer it the best I can. If you want to uh, sit down and chit chat about it further, learn more about CUPD, about what we offer, the resources we provide, stuff that goes on throughout the university, that's our contact information. Uh, I would suggest if, if that interests you, then please take me up on my offer, okay? Does anybody, and I know that was a lot, does anybody have anything else, any other questions? So, yep. So the question was, is there a difference between university police and other agencies and why Cornell has a university police, correct? It's kind of an easy question. Thanks for the softball. So there is not a difference between a municipality, the city of Ithaca and Cornell University police. Um, as far as training policies and procedures that we do, our community is the Cornell University community. The Ithaca City Police Department, their community is the city of Ithaca. We overlap and share jurisdiction, so that means that we work together. So if you guys live off campus and call 911 and get IPD, if it's a serious enough of an incident, uh, you will also see a CUPD car there also because you are a Cornell student we are responsible for your safety and we can offer additional resources to you that uh, another agency cannot due to whether they don't have those resources or they don't have the manpower personnel and time to offer that kind of stuff. Yeah, bud. So, so the question is, is walking around safe at the university a good idea or not at night? It, it is, you're safe. I mean, you can walk around by yourself. Um, I would just suggest like how I, for how I said that and how I phrased that may lead you to believe that there's a high crime, right? There is not a high crime, right? We have a lot of individuals out. We have a lot of people out. The university is safe. So if you wanna go out and about, 
throughout the night by yourself? You certainly can. Just be mindful that it's safer to travel in pairs. It's safer to travel in a well-lit area. It's safer to keep your cell phone in your pocket, not have your head down, keep your head up, be aware of your surroundings. Um, crime can happen anywhere, but generally speaking, those are just the safety 101 tidbits. Anyone want to see the slide of Luna one more time? Nah. All right. So is there any other questions? No, so you, the question is driving with an international license. You can drive with an international license. Um, just be mindful. If you get stopped and get pulled over, just present them that international license. Okay, as long as you have a valid driver's license. As long as you have a valid driver's license, yes. No, is she trying to get a New York driver's license or she just have a permit in general? Okay. Not that I'm aware of, but you can look it up on the New York State DMV. Uh, generally speaking, if you have an international driver's license and you get stopped, as far as CUPD is concerned, that is considered a valid driver's license if it's valid. The only hang up is it has to have, if it's in a language um, that needs to be interpreted, it has to have an interpretation to it so the officer then can read the client ID expiration and name on the driver's license. Any other questions? The, the whole, the scaffolding? So, there, so Barton Hall used to be an air um, military base and it used to be an airplane hangar. So if you go up top where the track is, you'll see that it, you could see why the vast size of it is made to handle military airplanes. Yeah, it's a track. So anytime you wanna come in, if you guys wanna come in to CUPD and have a tour, my email address is up there, shoot me an email. We can come in and give you a tour. You can see the cars, you can see the PD, you can meet the canines, we can do a demonstration for you. Um, all that's there, my information's there. So it's the first time it's readily been available. So if there's something that interests you or you have any questions, then look it up and take me up on it. One more question. Uh, a passport would work just fine. Uh, so the beer question, I don't know. That's a good question. You can see, it shows you how much we're going to actually look to see if you're buying beer because we don't, we're, we're not a distributor. So yeah, as long as you have, as long as all we need from, from us, we can look everything else up as a name and date of birth. So if you have a document that has that on there, as far as our functionality and what we require for information, that's all we need. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks folks. Appreciate it. If you guys need anything again, my email is up there. I can't it or say it enough. Uh, nobody wants to see Luna, correct? Okay. All right. Have a good day. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sergeant Justin. I uh, really appreciate the time and all of that information. We are now going to move on to our last piece. So um, give me just one second. So yeah, I hope everyone was able to learn a lot from these different presentations. Again, we're going to send out the recording. We're gonna send uh, the different links that are pertinent to all of you. Um, I wanna thank all of our speakers and specifically, again, Lauren Gabuzzi in the back. Lauren, wave your hand. Round of applause for Lauren who helped put all of this together.
you will get uh, many things from the Office of Global Learning uh, during your time here. You'll see our monthly newsletter. Uh, the first uh, uh, volume for this year will be going out this coming week. Uh, Lauren is behind that piece. Lauren uh, helps us put together a lot of different programs specifically for international students and with other uh, international focused organizations on campus. Student groups, uh, career services, Cornell Health, many others. So do please be on the lookout for some of the kinds of things that we're going to do um, in the months and the years ahead. Um, office of Global Learning, that's my office, that's our office. We are here for you. We're not always going to have every answer to your question, but we'll be able to refer you to the right people on campus um, when you do have a question. One second. So um, we're going to go move on to our uh, reception piece, but we have some people that are here, uh, international students and others that are just here to kind of talk through things um, while we're outside drinking hot chocolate. Um, people that are here from student organizations or other campus organizations, if you could come up really quick and just introduce yourself, um, that'd be great. Um, I think you all have red uh, name tags. There might be some other people outside there as well. Great, yeah, come on up. We're just gonna really quickly have you introduce yourself and what organization you are with. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Megan Caballero. I'm currently a senior studying human development in the College of Human Ecology. Um, I was born in the Philippines, but I grew up in Singapore and I'm the president of the International Students Union on campus. Hi everyone, my name is Stellar. I'm um, from South Korea. I'm, major, I'm a sophomore major in mechanical engineering. I'm also in International Students Union, but I'm also International Rep in Student Assembly. Uh, I'm not a student, but I work with international students uh, for over 30 years. So I'm an advisor for the Cornell International Christian Fellowship and also a chaplain of 3CURW for international students. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Ryan. I'm representing the Greater China Business Association Club. I actually don't know the full name, or the Canadian Business Club, uh, part of Johnson the Business School. I'm an MBA student. Hi everyone, my name's Megan. I'm a junior studying biomedical engineering, and I'm a, the president of Cornell Townies American Society. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, thank you to everyone who has participated, everyone that's watching uh, this recording. Um, again, please do be in touch with the Office of Global Learning. I'll be around, as will Lauren, if you have other questions right now. But that concludes for today, and we'll go out and we'll get something to eat and go walk through the snow on the way home. Thanks, everybody.